What's up y'all, Jesse Warden here today. We're gonna show you how to load and save progress for a character's game. So we can save the score, we can save the level, we can save the character's position, right? We're gonna do all of this with the memento pattern. First, we actually have to make more than one level, okay? So we have one right now I made from yesterday's code or Friday's code or whatever it was. Today we're gonna actually finish that level, save which level you were on, what your current score is, as well as where the actual player is located, all right? So these same concepts will work for everything else, what weapons they have, what bonuses or upgrades they have, everything else. It's all based around simple memento patterns, as well as being able to load an object with that particular state from that memento, okay? So they call it the memento pattern because it's kind of like a small little keepsake, small little object, right, or table that identifies a larger memory or a larger experience. So, for example, if you have, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, a handkerchief that your grandparents gave you, like, that can be a gateway to memories or a repository of emotions for a larger, you know, set of life experiences that you had, right? So if you have, like, a level, all you need to know is the X and Y of where it actually is positioned and where the character is positioned within it, and whether it's one or two, right? Very little numbers to create a larger hold, right? <clears throat> so we're going to do that today. So let's start uh, making level two. And we'll make uh, level two, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Let's make it um, high again. But we'll give it a little more hills than we had yesterday. Let's make these a little more, more thick. And zoom in just a bit so you can see here. We're working on. Remember, we can all have no more than eight vertexes if you remember a past video. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. It's all about the vertexes and how many have and too many because you can't do too many. That's a bite right there, man. Can't do too many vertexes. Too many. Not enough. Grass is always greener. That kind of thing. All right, we're going to make one more piece of geometry here for our wall. Give it a nice little incline. <clears throat> Gleaming the cube style. Yeah, I know. I just dated myself. I know. I know. Not afraid. All right, let's load these guys, or I'm sorry, export them into a level two directory. Actually, let's not. Let's be disorganized. So we'll say level one, just kidding, level two, A, save. The next piece, export it out As for the level two, B, okay. Two more to go, two down. Level two C. Did I tell you I'm tired today? I did uh, Body Beast back and buys and holy fish kebab. The weights are just getting heavier and heavier. I don't feel like I'm gaining strength. I feel like I'm getting more pathetic. And yes, I'm eating and taking supplements, so don't give me crap. Whew. Maybe I'm just a little little guy who's a pansy and needs to man up. Maybe that's it. Always a possibility. All right. Now we're done with Flizzash. Let's open Physics Editor. And we'll save this guy to Projects. Simple level. Let's save it right here. We'll call it Level 2. We'll add our level two sprites, which are already in the code directory. So we can have a single section from them. Make sure to change our exporter to Corona. And add some polygons manually. I'm not gonna do the trace. These are really simple polygons. But I will zoom in a bit to make it easier on the is eyes. Jesse, what are is eyes? These two things right here. Right here, you use them, you watch this video, you learn how to make things, you become awesome. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Do you feel me? Now we're going to give this guy level 2 A as the identifier. The density is 2, which is basically like a uh, hardened metal substance. Bounce and friction are basically 0 at this point. I don't want the character bouncing. I don't. I want them kind of sticking to it like Velcro. So that's the defaults, which is great. Do the same thing for this guy. Ooh, didn't mean to do that. Let's manually add them. Manually add them. Not add them. Add the polygons. Add the vertexes. Watch the concave and convex. You know, I really need to not uh, need a mnemonic device to tell the difference between those two because I cannot. All right, we're gonna save this out of paranoia. Although this is a tool made by Germans, I think. Thus, I shouldn't have to be paranoid because they are awesome. That's engineering. All right, let's move over here. And this guy only has four points, but he's kind of a weird rectangle shape. Save this guy. And add one last set of vertexes on this piece. To have a strange kind of hill. One, two. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. Come on. Give daddy a vertex. Go. All right, let's make sure these are all named level 2A, level 2B, level 2C. And again, we are identifying the box 2D geometry for our level. This will allow us to take these pieces of box 2D physics objects and put them together. The challenge with box 2D objects that are made from polygons is that these points are really hard to do in code manually and have it constantly refresh. It's easier to use this tool called Physics Editor, which does it for us because it's awesome. So I hit Publish, and I point it to here, Level 2 Lua. Voila. We now have our Level 2 geometry in there, and anytime we make a change, we just hit Publish, we're good to go. So I'm going to hit Save, and I'm going to hide this for now. Just kidding. I'm going to open Sublime, close all my 50 billion projects. Actually, I need to open that one. That was a good one. Go back. <clears throat> so we have this project from yesterday, if you recall. I'm going to shrink the window just a tad so we have some room to see the code. Okay, what we're going to do is we have our main, which kind of builds our level. Okay, but We need to organize this code to do two things, and that is it needs to have the capability to load an arbitrary level, level 1 or level two, okay? Additionally, it needs to take that level and position it in a certain X and Y, right? For us, we're not really going to be concerned with Y. Like, you know, some Super Mario Brother levels would actually go down, where the old school days would just go left and right. So we're just going to deal with the X for now. You can deal with Y later. Now, additionally, we got to also make a score. So as the user kind of like a uh, run game, he goes forward, and then he accrues points the longer he actually survives the level. We're going to do the same thing here, where the longer the level goes, the more points you get. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's organize this code a little bit more first. This, we're not going to make classes. I know you guys, some of you guys are like, why are you doing OOP and Lua WTF? So fine, let's just do a bunch of procedural functions in a functional language. Okay, so I don't offend uh, some of the C guys there. I hope there's C guys here. They're not as hard. They're harder to mess with than the Java guys. The Java guys are really easy. Take a piss out of those C guys are just rock solid. All right, so let's let's make a function called um, local load level. And again, this is entirely um, unscripted, so I'm kind of coding on the fly here. Didn't really plan this ahead of time, but I definitely like the idea of being able to save a level arbitrarily. So I wanted to do this for you guys. So let's uh, we've already have the sphere created right in the beginning but we don't have the actual level created so let's take the level creation part out and take this timer out because we don't actually want to move it but the actual creating the sphere creating the drag and drop for the sphere that's fine so what we'll do is we'll say okay we have a function that takes an arbitrary level which one level number 
Sounds good. Or how about this level? Let's give it a name. We'll use a string-based switch statement. Lua doesn't have switches, Jesse. You know what I mean. If then, whatever. Say build level one. And we'll put our build for level one in there. So level one will load the physics data for level one, which we've previously created in the previous video. It's going to create a floor from that particular pieces of objects. Now this uh, get floor function <clears throat> is a little helpful, except it's got a hard coded value internally for level one physics data, not level two physics data. So let's uh, fix that, shall we? Let's take this out. What I'm doing here is we're factoring code. It's where you take code and you make it better or more flexible or help it be modified to accept different growth. In this case, we're adding features to this code, right? So we're kind of massaging the code around a bit, trying to keep it, uh, keep the working code there, but move it around to work with others nicely, right? It's also an art. <laughs> There's a lot of people who claim that refactoring is a science with unit tests and everything else. But it is an art, ladies and gentlemen. We'll call it uh, physics data. This is now a parameter passed in. Okay? So we have the same naming convention of level 1-a for both the physics data. As you notice, we typed it in the physics editor, right? This tool here, level, level 2, right? That's the physics data or identifier to identify the box 2D, how it builds the shape, what its bounces, what its friction is, right? All that physics data. Just so happens that it's the exact same name as the ping for the file name that represents it, right? Now, for us, it's just the uh, debug geometry, right? Little yellow lines and squares for good high contrast. So, that is our refactored get floor function. Our level one will take that and then get floor with the name of the ping and the physics data as a now parameter to make that function a little bit more flexible. Now, there needs to be a way to destroy a level. Right? If you wanted to build a level, you need to be able to destroy it as well. The only way to do that is to have um, some way to retain those pieces of level parts so we can target them later in code to destroy them. So let's, let's do that now. Destroy level one. Now I'm not going to do a complete 100% destruction here because uh, like some of these things like physics data will just basically go away at the end of the function if it has no weird internal references. Okay. But we are going to keep main group around. So let's do this. Let's say we have a global variable at the top here. And I like to group my global variables like I did 10 years ago in Flash when I learned not to use global variables. Bye, we've come full circle. So we'll say current level, which is nil. This is just going to be a table to hold all our level parts. So later we can say, hey, hold this. When I'm ready to destroy you, I need to find those pieces of levels that I created and destroy each one, okay? Don't worry about remembering. I'll remember where they are. Just you hold them, okay? So we have this global variable that'll hold our current levels pieces. And we'll add it like so. Floor A equals floor A. And then we'll copy pasta, copy pasta coding. Floor B, floor C, I'm on a roll folks, on a roll. And that looks great. Now, take this, and we will destroy it, like so. Remove self. Remove self is a way to have the object in your Box2D geometry physically remove itself. The problem with remove self from Box2D object, if you're doing a collision, you can't really remove a body. So you got to be careful when you do that. For now, we're just removing level parts, actually borders of the level. So we're going to assume it's OK. So what we're going to do is just assume it'll work. We'll say floor A, remove, remove body. Just kidding. It's actually physics without the colon. I love API parity. Yeah. Consistency is great. Makes it easier to learn. B or C. Voila! We now have our level created from our dynamic physics data. These are the pings with the geometry data we added on um, physics editor. And we manually position them to make a nice looking level all fit. And then when we store it, 
So we have the opportunity to what? That's right, destroy it later. Now, if you want to be uber awesome, you could delete each one of these variables by sending them to nil. Or if you're lazy like moi, you can go, yo, current level, you, sir, are nil. To be extra, extra effective, you can do that, right? So you're a little more, you know, specific and saying you're targeting current level. We know current level is global, okay? So that's how you build and destroy level one. So let's just try it to make sure that it actually worked, okay? So we're not going to fill out our low level now. Let's just make sure our existing code still works. So we'll call build level one and we'll open Corona. Did I date myself again? I think I did. I'm not that old. <laughs> Just FYI. <laughs> Just FYI. Cool. Now we have an error and I will fix it. The current level is a nil value. Which is fine. Let's create it. Remember, because we set it to nil up here, we just did this to say, hey, we have a variable called current level. It's going to be used somewhere. It's nil. Well, of course it's nil. It's always nil unless you actually set it to something, which we do. Relaunch. Okay, so we have our level. Builds it. Cool. Now let's change build level to load level. Level one. We use a magic string. Then go to our load level and find a way to interpret said magic string as a makeshift switch statement. Now, if you're not familiar with the switch statement, it is a way to make if then statements more readable. Lua doesn't really care about language readability in terms of that kind of thing. It's more about size and execution style. And, Yo, what's up, C? We, we're, we're close, like this, like this. So you have to use an if then statement. If level equals equals level one, then build level one. Else if level equals equals. Level two, and then build level two. End. Now you'll notice we don't have a level two. But that's okay. We're gonna start with level one for right now. And see if it works. Relaunch. Doesn't like build level one because it is a local function. So let's make build level one a global function for now. And make destroy level one. Same one. Relaunch. Cool. So it still works. We had to modify our API, and this is fine. Those kind of errors we're finding, the unit tests would most often find if they were modules. But for now, we're just dealing with one file, a global style reference, that's fine. Now let's test our destroy level, see if it actually removes everything. We'll know if it worked, if the level destroys itself, we can't physically see it and the ball falls, right? Because the geometry is gone. Ready, go. We'll do a closure and we'll say after one second, please call destroy level one and do it one time. So no point of putting the iteration. Ready? Let's go. One one thousand. Whee! Fantissimo. It worked. And I don't see any errors in the console. Fantastic. Next up, let's start loading our level two. Now we're gonna remember, we're gonna have to build it. We don't actually have a build level two yet. But let's do that. Build level two. Now if you're familiar, we did this yesterday where we actually loaded the physics data, right, which is exported from physics editor. And we have all the physics data, but we have to manually position it. Additionally, we have some new floors. That's right, we have four, not three. So let's do that. Level two physics data from the level two file. What is level two file? It looks like this. I have level two A with all the fixtures and geometry and shape data that box to be loves to make level sides and floors and walls and stuff. We got it? Good. So, floor A is actually level two, level two, level two. And this is not one, it's two. Copy pasta code. Okay, we got D. Fantastic. We now have four floors in level two. Whee! Okay. Let's load level two. All right. There's our funky right side. And you'll notice it worked, which means I didn't have too many vertices. Instead of actually counting them and verifying ahead of time, I just go crazy and see if it works. Not suggested, but a lot more fun. Yes, Mr. Klein, I counted the vertexes and it'll be delivered by Saturday. Floor D is floor C. 
x plus 4 c's width. Sounds good, but it's a little too, you know, low. Not so good there, Jester. Jester Excel. Let's, uh, let's lower that just a bit, shall we? Let's get rid of the sidebar. Let me see my sidebar and mini map. Let's move this guy in just a tad. So we've got width, that's not bad. Let's move his D right up. Let's say 4D minus 60. Hmm, minus 100. Oh, wait, that's not 4D. That's 4D. Let's try 100. There we go. 110. Oh, 110 centimeters. It's not bad. Sorry, we'll that ball is slab. Oh, there we go. It's like a half pipe. Gonna kick some mad alleys, bro. Alright, we're gonna move main group over just so I can see some stuff. Oh, wrong way. Same minus 200 just so I can actually see. There we go. So our C needs to go down a bit. So let's start from the bottom. Oh. Okay, let's go higher. Let's add some pixels. Oh, not that many. Let's try to get to 34. 34. Ooh, Otacon. Give a box. Um, let's try six. Eight. Fantastic. Let's go over another 100 pixels and see how our four on the right is doing. There she is. Alright, so we're gonna go with 4D again. And we know that the Y is actually good. But the X is gonna come back up to That's good. I like that. Let's go down and make the pixel. Maybe just a little bit down. Alright! Fantastic. So that's level 2. Now let's be able to destroy level 2 in case you were on level 2 and you load a game that actually loads level 1. Got it? Doing the consistency here. Build a level, destroy a level. It's the natural state of the world. Entropy. All things eventually devolve into chaos. And the kind of continuance drives against entropy to build epicness. And that's, uh, yeah, that's good. Yes. Build things that are going to get destroyed. I like George Carlin's uh, philosophy of maybe the world created us strictly to make plastic because it couldn't make it on its own. That was, that was cool. Alright, so again, we have to store the references. So you're going to create that object to store it. So store level 2. The only difference between level 1 and level 2 is that level 2 has four four objects. Like this is a box for the geometry. And Build basically have the same thing. If we were awesome and we can keep the same names, we could actually reduce these build level 2 and build level 1 functions into the same function. And this tests for the existence of the pizzas if they would actually name the same. We're not going to get that crazy with the fact that we can do that kind of dryification with the dry terms for the computer. That's a good practice. Alright, current level is nil. So we're going to that. Low level 2, we'll call build level 2. And then down here, I'll create the level and pass me four objects. Alright, I'm good. I like it. Now, what do you want? Main level 140? Uh, let's destroy level 2, you silly goose. There we go. Let me go, Mr. Warden. Let me go. Alright. Finally, Let's uh, start progressing our start game and stop game to the level. Okay? So this is a game state with a piece of code. So we say start game in group. In group. Minus some minus speed two, perhaps. Sounds good. Put this sucker in a uh, timer. It has a closure. That looks JavaScript-esque. Okay. There we go. 
And let's get our game timer. We're not supposed to use timers in games. We can game to keep them simple. So we'll say, uh, game timer ID. Perfect. All timers return an ID with which you can choose to cancel them later. That is what we were storing in this game, our timer ID. Notice it is not using local, so it's the same thing as doing this, which is an implied global variable. However, I'm not going to do underscore g because we're all in the main that little file, and it's just assumed that they are all global. End game. We'll take if game timer ID. The timer cancel basically stop the timer run. So that's what start game and stop game do. And I'll take that extra function out. And then we'll call low level 2 and start the game. Let's get rid of this uh, trust. And I forgot the last parameter because I'm a what? Goofball, silly bam, run infinitely. Yeah, it's a little too fast, Mr. Wood. There we go. So the goal is to get the ball and bring it here before it falls away. Right? So that's the game. It's like one of those infinite runners, and you have to manually drag it up the hills, anything else like that. Right? Otherwise, it'll roll away. And once you get to the end here, the game is over. Okay? So let's detect that the game is, in fact, over. In our timer, let's expand this a bit. And say, how about run game? That sounds good. Let's put a run game function. So we don't need our closure anymore. Notice I'm refactoring on the fly here. Save it. Instantaneous checking of your code. Again, this is the wonderful quick iteration feature of code in action. So we're running our game now. Let's say. Speed it up a bit. Let's say when it reaches about six, let's say 700. When main group reaches 700, um, let's say current level name to identify what is the current level name running, level one, level two, as a string, right? And we'll set this inside of load level. G current level name equals level. Okay, it's going to be level 1 or level 2. That way, when we're running the game, we can say if main group x is less than or equal to 700, and then in game. And then speed it up for you. Okay? And it's not that. Actually, negative seven. There we go. As soon as it gets to the end here, it'll stop. Voila. We now have an in game function, kicking it live. Alright, we now have the ability to end the game. But let's make sure we're doing it with uh, level one. So, if G is level one and I mean, group x is less than or equal to negative 700, then we're done. Okay? Level 2 is going to be different, and here's why. Keep in mind, this is level 2, so it's still level 2. Level 1 is going to be different, and here's why. Level 1 is a bit smaller, so let's identify what level 2 is. Point group x. Let's say here's about 300. So, if this entire thing level 1 is 400, else go. So that tells us when level 1 is done, when it's reached this position. Now, Let's make sure that we reset it every time we load the level because now our end game is determined by the end position of the main group. So let's reset it, shall we? We'll go main group, which is a global displayed group that I created at the very top. X equals zero to reset the level. Right? 
So now we can load multiple levels. What's that you say? You want to test loading multiple levels? Let's try it. Let's stop the game. Let's say timer, perform with delay. Now, anybody catch the problem before I code it? I'll give you uh, 20 seconds to figure out why. I have to destroy the level before I create it. It's right. So let's make our destroy functions a little bit more flexible and say if the current level equals nil, then go ahead and return true, get out the thing destroying it. Okay? You don't want to error out. It should be okay to call this function multiple times. Okay? Same thing for destroy level. Okay? To be error mode for now. Now we have to determine what level is loaded to know which one to destroy. So let's do that. If the, the current level mode equals level one, that means that somebody built a level called level one. In which case we can safely destroy level one. Else, if the current level mode is level two, then we can safely destroy level two. Otherwise, it's nil. No one's ever created an actual level. Thus, there's no destroy. Make sense? Cool. So, let's uh, restart this and notice after about two seconds it's going to load level 2. So it's going to start with level 1. Ready? Here we go. 1,002. Boom! Level 2. And notice level 1 has no hill here and level 2 does. Watch. See? Boom! And the sphere is the same thing. Right? Now, we could reset the sphere's position. So let's do that. Let's find out where he starts. The main sphere starts up here at 100 by 200. So let's just make it simple. Let's give the sphere a method. Reset. And I'm not going to change it to self. You could if you wanted. You could change this to self. If you sphere. Say sphere.reset. So the thing starts. And then up here, when we load the levels, we reset the sphere's position. So that works, that jumps back up there. All right, now, now that we know we can load and delete arbitrary levels at any point in time, let's deal with loading level two once you are completed with level one. In game, kills the game timer. If the current level one equals level one, and then we can proceed to level two, which is what? Load level two. Otherwise, do nothing. If you're at level nothing, don't do anything. If you're at level two, we're done. So we go to the end, and load level two, you set the sphere and go over. Notice it didn't start the game. So let's do that. Let's build the level. Let's load the level. Sphere reset. Start the game. You no longer have to call start game because it already starts. And then to be paranoid, let's make a method that wraps our timer. Kill game if game timer ID, then cancel game timer ID. Anytime we ever deal with the game timer, we will call this kill game timer. That way we guarantee we only ever have one timer ever running. In level one, loads level two, and starts the game. And then, once level two is done, it does nothing, because there's nothing else to work. You got it? Cool. Now that we have the capability of loading level one, automatically resetting all the sprites to where they belong, as well as loading that particular level, we can load those levels in any order. The only logic that cares about order is when the game's over. If you're level one, it'll go to level two. That's the only really thing that anywhere in this entire code that cares about next and back, right? So each one of these things should be able to run in the Now, how do we save that? Well, first off, let's remember, 
The memento pattern is the ability to ask objects, hey, give me an object or a table that retains a state that you care about. Later on, I'm going to give you this object back, and I expect you to reset yourself to what that is. So I'm going to be very verbose. You don't have to call it the get memento and set memento method. But that's what I'm going to do just to be very verbose about that. So our first thing is a player's object. We care about the player's object because we want to know what is uh, some state that would represent you, right? where have you been. Additionally, we need to be able to give it back this object later so it can reset itself. Right? We're also concerned about our levels. Right? Where were they in the position? You know, where were they positioned? How were they? And finally, our game's code in general, what level did you load? Right? So we're going to do that as well. We're going to save score to last so we can get these three points. Sphere, level, and which level to load, and level position. Make sense? All right, first up, sphere. Sphere's memento is get memento and set memento. Stop typing in game. Silly code in game. He's going to return a memento or a table with, hey, here's my position as it stands right now, with my X and Y. That's all I need to be reset back in my state. When you give me my memento, the fresh maker. Not mementos. We'll say self that x is that. Self that y is that. That's it. That's all it's required to give it and set it on memento. So let's do that. Number two, level. Let's make sure that the levels are capable of identifying what they are. We're going to make a controller level function to do that. So we'll say get level level memento, which will return basically which level we're at and what is its position. Level name, g current level name. So we know what level to actually build, level one or level two. Additionally, what is the current position of that level in its y? We're not really concerned about y again. We're just doing the old Super Mario Brothers, so let's just say the x. Which is in this case main group dot x. Now, that's all the information we need to reset this entire code base. What level? And where was the main group in the point in time you were at? Right? Set level memento. This will react to setting the level. The key here is do you want to start the game when you set the memento or not? Usually not. You want to update object states, everybody, the sphere state, the level states, the controller state. But usually only controller-based code, the code that runs your app, not actually shows your app, is the kind of code that should be affected by those kind of state changes. So resetting the spheres X and Y and setting the levels X and Y shouldn't start the game over. It's the controller's responsibility to go, okay, everyone's memento set, I'm ready to start the game over. Got it? So when we get this level now, we can do what we've always done, that's load level, right? So let's do it. Load level, instead of hard coding the value, we're going to get it from our memento, or table that remembers our state, memento, dot level name. And you can see that property name maps to this memento property. Right? Additionally, once we've loaded the main group in load level, if you remember, Reset a bunch of properties at the move level. Remember, sphere reset, main group. And now we're going to override that with what is in the memento, which is what? The x value. So your x is equal to that x. Okay? Great. Now you can remember where a level was, as well as remember where it, its position was, as well as where its spheres was. Now, you may notice a problem is that this particular level doesn't retain the sphere. Somebody else has to group both of those. So let's say save game or get game memento. This is where you do a series of composition calls. So let's make this a little bit more multi-line so you can see. We'll call this game save of the table. Game save contains a Sphere memento, remember, the sphere has its own. And up here, the sphere has a method for that called get memento. 
So uh, Sphere, Git, Memento. Game Save also has a level Memento. So we'll call Git level Memento. Return Game Save. Function set game memento. All right, it's always a get and set memento. This memento is going to be the exact same thing as the game save. So we will take this guy and first do the set level memento with the game saves dot level memento, which will reset the level state. All right. Next, we'll take the sphere set memento to the spheres memento. Voila, you now have the ability to save the game. So how do we make it work? Two things are required for making a save game to work. Number one, you have to write a save game file. This can be anything. RAM, you need SQLite. Jesse Warden writes JSON for two reasons. Number one, it's simple. Number two, JSON and tables are nearly the exact same syntax. So it's simple and easy to read. It also requires very low code. Also, from the southern states of America has metered in. So that's what we're going to do. So let's save game. We're going to take our game save memento, which is git game memento. Okay, we've got a Lua table. Now what do we do with it? Well, we convert it to a JSON string. And if you remember from JSON, it's a little bit like this. Encode. Hit the JSON uh, game save memento. Now we have a JSON string of our game. This string encapsulates our entire game save data. Okay. Now we're going to save this file. I'll implement this function in a bit. I'm going to encapsulate that later. You don't need to know the internal file. Just know that it saves to the local device, whether it's iPhone or Android, or I'll save the string file. To the actual games directory. Okay. And then we say load game. Now you'll notice that this is singular. This means you only have one saved game and you can only load one game at a time. That's okay. So we'll get our JSON string. Read save string and file. Notice it takes no parameters, it assumes there's only one file with a hard coded file name. Okay. JSON objects. And we get our game save memento, which is converted back and then decode it from the game save string, which is the string that shot. And then set game memento. Now, I understand those two functions might have been a lot for you, so let's walk through them again. If you want to save your game, have to know each object's memento or its current state at this given point in time. Each object, it helps if they're responsible to help delegate the responsibility of remembering everyone's state. So Sphere, just give me an object and tell me you know, what you need to, to remember where you were at, x and y position. The helpful reason, well, yeah, the reason that's helpful is that you can actually add a different, you know, different objects to that as your game objects grow in complexity. The game guy remains the same. This is what we call get memento. You could add a ton of different properties there. Strength, dexterity, current weapon commits, yada yada, it's all there. Score, right? But the API of get memento and set memento saves is the same. So everybody, including the level, is now capable of giving me this large little table of all the properties of like X, Y, current level name, and the current main group position. I take that and convert it to a string or a JSON string. It takes little tables and converts into a string. A big old string. It's a special format called JSON. I then save that to disk. Disk, also known as on the hard drive of the phone, iOS, Android, in this case, similar to desktop. Right? Later, when I call load game, it'll read that string from that saved text file. It'll convert it back to a JSON object or a little table, right? And now it's a little table. We can give it back to our game to rebuild from those copies from that particular memento. Got it may take a few times to, to get it. That's basically the concept. And as your game grows, you just add more momentum to the sub-objects because you have different objects. Right? So if, you, if they need to save, you know, some things don't need to save, right? Maybe the player destroyed a certain part of the level and the level needs to remember that. So you could actually add that particular part to that momentum, right? 
Again, we're not saving everything, all the objects. We're saving little pieces of data that it can extrapolate those larger memories from. Right? All right, so that is that. Now, lastly, we need to make buttons. We're going to make two. We're going to make a save game button and a load game button. Right? And they'll, they'll basically stop the game and immediately load or save the game. If it's a save game, it's not going to stop the game, but it may be a little bit slow because it's a, a synchronous operation. I'm going to use a synchronous write to disk, not an asynchronous which means that kernel may have to slow down a minute to finish saving the file. Depends on the device and what else is going on. Now we have to so let's actually implement these functions for saving the file to disk. And keep in mind, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on these. You shouldn't have to care. This is the kind of stuff that's just utility functions or utility classes. Uh, really don't have much to do with saving. But again, some people would prefer to save in SQLite. Some people would actually want to save it to a back end somewhere for a cloud-based save service. It's up to you. I'm just making a quick, simple service that I whipped together to do this for you, okay? So let's implement those two save methods, read methods. This one takes the parameter of JSON string. We're gonna load a service that I have lying around called load save service. Actually, it's not even local. Let's fix that. There we go. Load save. String service. Require. Then, let's, uh, let's save. Is that the method save? Pretty sure it's save. Right. Oh, it actually returns an instance. My bad. It's going to be new. There we go. I have to get an instance because I'm a good little Java oop born coder. Oops. Okay. Service save. It's going to take this JSON string representation of our level and save it to a file called progress.json in the documents directory. Documents directory is different on desktop Mac, desktop PC, Android, and iOS. So just know it's where documents that your ob application will read and write go to. I do not believe they're deleting the uh, applications on the sub either, but that's topic for another day. So, service save will actually save your JSON. And service read, we'll give it back. This case gets load. It has no parameters, but it does take a return value. I'll do some string. Which then returning it back to you. Reload. 258. Oh my gosh. It's a messed up looking function. Excuse me, princess. All right. Now, let's make our two buttons. I'm going to whip together some widgets to get this done. So we'll create that new button. We'll call it um, C button. Make sure I import widgets before you know that. By Corona. And we'll put it on the bottom. 200, 300, right, do not care. Save. Save. On save, button touched. We'll implement this function up here. Save button. Let's move it. Uh, Left just a tad, what do you think? That looks good. And we'll make our load button. Put it in the exact same place, except the top will be about put some extra. So let's see, 360. About 10 of border there. ID, load. Be a little more explicit, shall we? Let's say save the level. Load. Level. On load button touched. Again, these callback functions are when somebody clicks the particular button are pretty simple because each just calls save game and load game. Let's do it. Save game. Load game. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple. 
Now, keep in mind, load game won't work unless you have a save data file. So you will see explosions of errors of high magnitude. Let's slow our main group down to about a half pixel. That's good. You'll notice our level has disappeared. I'm going to wait for this piece to actually go and hit save. Okay, so now it's saved the level. We should be able to load it at any arbitrary point that we want. As you can see, each time the ball rolls in. Now, let's do it again, but this time, let's drag the ball with us. And save it right near the end where the ball is sitting nicely up on this mountain top. Save. Now, we're going to let the ball roll down, load, and sit on the mountain top, sit on the mountain top, sit on the mountain top, sit on the mountain top. Now, you'll First, uh, kind of like, Jesse, why is the ball flying? Box2D retains inertia. So just because you move a Box2D object X and Y, you are not stopping the angular impulse or inertia or spinning, as well as the regular impulse of it actually moving about. So you might have to reset the angular impulse to zero and the linear impulse to zero as well, anytime you build a level, right? So if we stop the ball, like let it stop, it's saying, then load the level. It shouldn't remember its actual inertial impulse. Unless we let it roll down the hill and then load. See how that works? So this goes back to, okay, well, let's, let's make that not happen, right? Well, maybe you want to remember the inertia. Maybe an enemy was falling right when you saved your game. So that's up to you to determine what you want to do when you save that particular piece, okay? So let's do level two. We move to the end here. Okay, we'll make, make it a little bit faster. Let's go to. Uh, Speed two, so we don't have to wait. Grab our ball. Ta da, we're at level in. We need to reach the point. All right, now, let's save one on the top. Save. Okay. Now, we're on level one, we hit load. Load level two on the top. We're at level one, load the level, put it to the top. Got it? So that's loading and saving. Now, your next question is how do we extend this for school? How do we remember other pieces of data beyond just spheres location? Levels location, how do we expand upon these mementos? Well, let's, let's make that. Let's build a score text at the top, right? Add some data to it, how long you've been playing, right? And how many uh, clicks you made for the ball to actually move around. And then we will save that score and load it. Create a text field at the very top. Right, get us a metal sphere. Say, um, the score text. We also have to remember what our score is. So let's say score zero. Score text is display new text. Value is zero. X and Y are so stage width minus uh, 60 should be good. System, I think it's system. There it is. All right. Now, what we'll do is we'll say every time that you pick up the sphere, let's add some points to that. Maybe it's dragging things around. So we'll say every time the phase began, increase score. Increase that. Score plus 10. Or let's do some, let's do 12. It's a little easier to see the numbers add at a time. Okay. So every time we click this here, we get 12 points, right? And we're going to update our score text equal to the current score. Okay. Increasing over time. Okay. This will retain between levels. Now, unfortunately, when we load level, we notice the score doesn't change at all. So let's reset the score when we actually load a level, right? Because loading is supposed to load a particular score. So we'll do that. And then additionally, we'll save our score. So let's go back to our save game. 
turns everything. Our game save memento gets the game memento. So let's find that out. Our game save has the sphere where he is, the level where he is, and let's add the score. Score equals score. Okay? And when we set the level memento, or set the game memento, we do that, it'll actually update the score. So let's do a function called set score. Let's reset it to when we want it to be. So we'll say memento, memento, dot score. It's a number. So it's like another helper, fu helper function. Let's do our increase score. Check score. And then score text. Text equals two score. Okay. Bring it up. So the game at 36. Load the level at 36. Load the level at 36. Now, let's get all the way to 48 and load that. Just kidding, let's get up to 22. Right, we're at 84, and we'll save it at 96, in the middle of level 2. Now, on level 1, we've done nothing, we've load the level, and there we go, just where we're going to On level 2. Make sense? So that is using the memento pattern to both get and set mementos, or rule tables that help larger objects, classes, modules, whatever, remember the state that they were in, so you can load that state later. All of them together allow you to create a seed game state that you can both read from and load from later. So you can reset your entire game's level 1, level 2, you can score, play your position, and weapons, and all that. And you take that Lua table, convert it to a string, save it to the disk on the phone, and then read it out later, convert it back to a Lua table from JSON. And there you go, that's how you do it. So again, if you have any questions, my name is Jesse Warden. You can me on Twitter, email, YouTube comments, please don't forget forget to subscribe on there. I've got uh, all the questions you guys have been asking, giving me a lot of ideas, and I've been helping a lot to create content. And uh, definitely taking me places I didn't think I'd go. I thought you guys were wanting more about app stuff, but a lot of the stuff. So, yeah, keep your questions coming. They're really helpful. I appreciate it. And uh, I've got a long list of videos now for me to figure out priority, whatever. So, again, hope this is helpful. Thanks for your time.